I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the CPMA post-election webinar. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping notes that I want to review. We are offering simultaneous translation. For those of you that would like to use this service, please go to the interpretation icon at the bottom of this screen. It is the globe icon. By clicking on that icon, you can select the language which you'll be hearing the presentations in. Uh, there is a, an English option and a French option. And you'll be able to select your language of preference. As well, we will be entertaining questions at the uh, during the uh, webinar. We will have a staff member monitoring the Q&A box, which is also at the base of your screen. Please post your questions in the Q&A uh, box, and we would be happy to answer those questions throughout the webinar. Now, as a result of Canada's recent federal election and the return of a minority parliament in Ottawa, we will undoubtedly see how this minority parliament will shape a post-COVID recovery and how our industry moves forward. This webinar will bring an industry perspective to election results, to the election results, and what they will mean to the fresh produce industry and our business and policies and priorities moving forward. To start things off, we're very fortunate to have David Coletto, CEO of Abacus Data. David's going to share his in insights into the post-election political environment in Canada. And then afterwards, David is going to help me moderate a roundtable of industry leaders who will dive deeper into the issues and where they may lie ahead. So David, over to you. Well, thanks, Ron. Uh, good to see you again and, and great to be here uh, sharing um, some data and some perspectives. So I'm going to get right into it. And obviously, uh, for a pollster, a federal election is like a 36-day uh, Super Bowl. And uh, by the end, I was exhausted. And we, if you don't know the results by now, uh, not a whole lot changed. But I think there's some important insights about you know, what happened during the campaign, how Canadians were responding to the political leaders and the issues and what that means going forward and what this new government that was sworn in uh, just, um, just two days ago and um, the new parliament that's gonna emerge uh, next month will mean for, for your sector and, and for the broader economic and social landscape in the country. Now we know the result, right? Mr. Trudeau called this election when he didn't have to, when many people thought uh, he shouldn't and he wasn't rewarded for that effort. He certainly wasn't, uh, though, completely uh, disciplined for it either. He held on to a minority government, picked up um, one or two seats, and, and really, you know, the, the makeup of parliament looks looks very much the same. But from my vantage point, the question is, you know, what happened? When you look at vote intention, our tracking, we were, we were doing a survey every week during the campaign. Um, coming into the campaign, the reason why, you know, the Liberals felt confident was because they had you can see even in early August, a 12 point lead over the Conservatives. Um, soon after that election called that, that lead started to drop. And within the first three weeks of the election, we had a dead heat. And that really didn't change uh, for the remainder of the campaign. And so, in fact, when you look at the national numbers, we really didn't see much movement throughout this campaign. The New Democrats were stuck um, in the low 20s or, or, or high teens. You had the Liberals and the Conservatives more or less, you know, uh, fighting for, for the top place in terms of popular vote. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the Conservatives, like they did in 2019, won more votes than the Liberals did. But the Liberals, because of how their votes are distributed and how efficient their vote is in, in major urban centres across the country, uh, won more seats than the Conservatives, and, and by a pretty clear margin. So, uh, but we still have a minority parliament. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, later, but we are left with only, you know, a handful of seats uh, ch changing hands and, and almost like a deja vu kind of an election. But there's some important, I think, uh, impacts um, and, and results that really speak to some growing divisions uh, within the Canadian electorate that I think is going to have some influence um, over the politics as we move forward. One of them being the, the urban and rural divide. This is the vote intention, and I just focused on the Liberal and Conservative vote share. This was from our final survey of the campaign, um, which did a good job at estimating. Un bon travail estimé les résultats finaux, et vous pouvez voir que dans le Canada urbain, dans les centres urbains, 
c'est un, un, une avance de 5 points des libéraux. Dans le Canada rural, c'était une avance euh, plus élevée pour les conservateurs et dans les banlieues, c'était essentiellement euh, un nez à nez. Et quand on voit en Ontario, la division est encore plus nette euh, pour les secteurs urbains, c'est plus que le double ou presque le double. Et dans l'Ontario... Euh, I think was really told, and you can replicate this in British Columbia, the Liberals um, held on to much of their support. Around les libéraux ont gardé leur appui dans les grandes régions euh, urbaines. Et ça a été encore plus vrai au Vancouver, dans la grande région de Vancouver. Et je pense que euh, c'est vraiment l'histoire de cette campagne. Alors, the Liberal government that was already Uh, very much concentrated in the large, largest urban centers in the country, that was further, um, further emphasized in these results. They lost a handful of seats in Nova Scotia and rural parts of Nova Scotia New, and Newfoundland and Labrador. They lost one seat there. And I think that's uh, further uh, reduced the number of voices from smaller communities and more rural parts of this country in that Liberal caucus. Um, that's a reflection of it. So that's to me the big, big kind of outcome. And there's lots of numbers to unpack Um, in terms of, of where this election goes. But I think in order to understand where this parliament might head and, and the um, choices that, that different uh, decision makers in Ottawa are now going to think about is to think a little bit about what this campaign was about. And for a campaign that ended very much like it started in terms of the makeup of parliament, it does seem to some, it could seem like some, that nothing's really changed. But this was a campaign in which a number of factors, I think, ultimately led to the outcome that we got. For the first, the first question we always ask is, was this a change election? When we asked Canadians throughout the campaign, you know, to what extent do you want change? Do you definitely want to see a change in government? Would you like to see change, but it's not that important? Um, would you like to see the incumbents reelected, or you definitely want to see the Liberals reelected? What you see uh, in these bottom two charts is, yes, the desire for change increased, over the course of the campaign. But when we compare to the end of the last election in 2019, the numbers were almost exactly the same. And so there was a large number of people across the country who did want to see a change in government, but it never reached the threshold by which it seriously put the Liberals um, in jeopardy. And so they were able to hold on to their minority, able to hold on to almost all of the seats that they had in large part because the electorate largely didn't shift or turn on them, especially those that voted Liberal uh, back in 2019. And so this, this was partly a change election, but it was mainly a change election to the people who wanted change last time. And, and uh, none of the opposition parties were really able to convince uh, those who voted Liberal in 2019 to, to, to change gears. Now, what, what we know this election was at least uh, about partly far longer than many people assumed was the election call itself. When we asked respondents, what impact did Justin Trudeau calling this election have uh, early on your likelihood to vote Liberal? We could see that more than half of people said that it made me either less likely to vote Liberal or I will not vote Liberal because of this, including a sizable number of people who voted Liberal in the last election. And so for, lot, for some, it didn't matter. But for a large number, this idea that this election wasn't necessary, that it shouldn't have been called, you know, as the fourth wave was was emerging, that this was, you know, hubris on the part of the prime minister for trying to just win a majority, that stuck um, in a way that many people, including myself, didn't think would. And it kind of um, was a cloud that, that sort of, you know, hung over the liberal campaign and Mr. Trudeau throughout. He couldn't get uh, out of it. And, and so, you know, I think it did probably set a precedent for future early elections in that we can't assume that people are just going to forget that that election was called. Now, We're, we're living through, you know, not normal times still, and there was a pandemic still uh, ongoing in, in all parts of the country to some extent when this election was called. What's notable about this is that we've been tracking whether people are becoming more or less worried about the pandemic. The red line here are the percentage of Canadians who say they're getting more worried over the last few days. The green line are those who say they're getting less worried. And you can see that as we came out of the spring, the number of people who said they're getting more worried really dropped substantially into the summer to the point where in mid-July you had for the first time far, far more people saying, my anxiety level's coming down, right? People are getting vaccinated, the case numbers are dropping. I, I, I kind of feel we're going to get out of this pandemic. 
And just as the prime minister called this election, we saw a spike again in the level of anxiety that that really reached back to where it was during the second wave of the pandemic. And so that level of anxiety sustained itself through large parts uh, through the entire entirety of the campaign period. And so what what happened was the prime minister um, almost waited too long to call the election if, if, if timing and, and the, the, uh, the severity of the, the pandemic was an issue. But what it also did, I think, was it put to focus some of the issues this uh, government wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about mandatory vaccinations. They wanted to talk about travel restrictions. They wanted to, um, you know, put the conservatives um, on notice. Now, it wasn't enough, though, because when we ask people in our survey, if the pandemic gets worse, which party would you prefer to be in charge of managing things? You can see here that the Liberals had a six-point lead over the Conservatives. This was an issue that they benefited from, that if people were voting based on who they wanted to manage the pandemic, the Liberals uh, would do very well. The problem for them was that a quarter of those who, who said the Liberals didn't end up voting for that party. They voted for some other party. And so they weren't able to fully take advantage of the fact that they had a natural advantage on this issue. Now, there are some key issues in this campaign. When we asked Canadians at the end of the election, what are the top issues facing the country? Well, obviously, the pandemic for more than half was in their top three issues. The cost of living throughout this campaign and headed into this campaign, and it's only probably intensified given um, you know, the, the, the data that we're now seeing coming out about the cost of living. We'll talk about it on the panel after my presentation. But for Canadians, it's a serious issue. The cost of food, cost of gas, the cost of housing, big, big issues that all the parties in some way tried to address. Healthcare, the economy and the environment uh, round out the top five. And if you think about the campaign, these were the issues the parties largely were talking about, right? They, there was, I think, a reflection of the issues that voters want to hear from their leaders reflected in the campaign. Now, the campaign wasn't about one of these, but when we asked people, when we looked at how people voted based on which issue they thought was most important, this gives us an indication of, you know, if the ballot question was about a particular issue, who, who would have benefited from it? So for those who said the pandemic was a top issue, you can see the Liberals had an eight-point lead over the Conservatives among that group. Among those who said the cost of living or inflation was a top issue, no real advantage for any party. The Conservatives slightly ahead of the Liberals, but neither of them really won the day among those voters most anxious about the cost of living. On health care, same thing. There was some early debates about whether Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, was going to you know, bring in private elements to the health care system. They tried to attack him on it. It didn't end up working because people who said health care was a top issue, they were just as likely to vote conservative as they were liberal. So no one won on the health care issue. But we did see some distinctions on the economy. Of those who said the economy was a top issue, the conservatives won by 17 points over the Liberals, and look at the NDP, only 8% voted NDP who thought the economy was issued. So if the economic situation of the country was, the macroeconomic situation was top of mind, you are far more likely to vote Conservative than uh, either Liberal or the, certainly the New Democrats. On the flip side, you're a climate change or environment voter, someone who said, this is the, one of the most important issues for me, you can see the Liberals um, really won easily on that. And this was a top issue for about a third of Canadians. And so it was important. And we're seeing this week as COP starts in, in, in Glasgow on the weekend, uh, the talk about climate change um, becomes important. You can look at the Green Party, 3% of those who said the, the environment was their top issue um, voted Green, right? Shows how weak that party was and, and where the parties were. So where do we go from here? And we're gonna have a great conversation today about this. We had the new cabinet sworn in on Tuesday morning. Um, a lot of familiar faces, but a lot of shuffle and movement. And I think you can, you can learn a lot about the priorities of the prime minister and um, by the, the, the folks he puts into different positions. The first thing I will say from my perspective is this is a cabinet um, that I think is going to be tasked with uh, uh, delivering on a fairly ambitious agenda. There are big problems uh, both here at home and around the world to deal with. We'll talk about many of them, supply chains, shortages, um, recovering from the pandemic from an economic perspective. There's climate change, there's housing affordability, there's a healthcare system that's pretty much on its knees and will need federal help to get up from it. And you look at the economic team, and this is just a handful of the ministers, there's, there's far more that the prime ministers put together. Uh, clearly the relationship with the United States, which many thought would be 
golden after Trump left office. Hasn't been that way. Um, so Ms. Freeland and Ms. Ning on, on the trade side uh, and the finance side, Mr. Champagne on, on innovation, they're going to be trying to driving through uh, an economic agenda that, that demonstrates to people that this government has a vision on the economy. I think it's struggled on that. But the issue, the, the team that is most interesting to me um, is the climate change team. Mr. Guibault uh, from Quebec is a former climate activist, worked for environmental organizations, but previously was Minister of Heritage. He's been given his, I think, dream job, right? The job to, to drive ahead with the government's climate agenda. So if you are in the sector thinking about plastics, thinking about um, uh, emissions, thinking about sustainability, I don't think there's been an environmental, uh, a minister of the environment who has a personal stake in this as much as Mr. Gibo does, which signals to me that the prime minister wants these final years that he's in office uh, to be about his legacy on climate. Um, and so that's going to be both an opportunity, but also a potential threat. So to wrap up, it's clear to me that that minority government is, is probably now a constant in Canada. Um, this is the fifth in, in since 2004, we've, we've had more minority election outcomes than majority since pretty much I was <laughs> working in this field starting in 2004. Um, and given the, the way the votes are structured and the, the number of parties, we now have the People's Party emerged during this election, fragmentation and, and, and the lack of one party being able to win, you know, 40% of the vote or more seems to be more likely to happen than less. This government comes into office I think with a very ambitious agenda. As much as, as the election left uh, Parliament looking very much like it was, um, you look at the party's platform and you've got a lot of big things that it needs to do. Child care, economic recovery, getting the pandemic finished, uh, climate change, housing, all of these. And, and the cabinet that's been put in place, I think, signals that the government realizes it hasn't done enough. Um, and I think maybe learned it lesson that the public is paying close attention and doesn't think it's done enough on some of these big issues. It's also noteworthy, just from a purely political perspective, of the, of the people that the Prime Minister put in some of the key portfolios. Right? There's a conversation in Ottawa saying that he put a lot of the, the people he, people have been talking about as his, as his potential successors into key roles uh, to see whether they can perform or not. And so not only is there going to be high stakes for this government, but the Ms. Freeland, Ms. Jolie, uh, Mr. Champagne, Mr. Guibault, all of these folks, they may have their sights set on the um, on the prime minister's chair. And so they're going to be working extra hard to be seen as, as delivering and moving their files forward uh, so they can position themselves perhaps to replace Mr. Trudeau when he does decide to retire or resign. Lastly, at the end of the day, though, this is about ending the pandemic. And I think the recovery um, will be the overriding focus for the next 12 months. So, Ron... Uh, that is my uh, kind of quick snapshot, obviously, you know, to sum up a 36 day campaign in 15 minutes, that really was very much set by the years that, that you know, before as we went into it is, is difficult, but um, um, there, there it is. And so I look forward to the conversation and um, uh, bringing in our, our great panel. Thanks, David. Insightful as always. And you know, when uh, when I listen to the landscape and what the uh, potential future looks like under this current minority government, it's going to be interesting. So let's dive right into our panel and get an industry perspective relative to you know, what does this minority government look like? What are the issues that we're going to be dealing with? How do they link in? You touched on a couple key ones. So I'd like to introduce our, uh, our panel who bring a wealth of experience across the supply chain. And I'll start with Larry McIntosh our CPMA chair from uh, 2007, and recently retired CEO of the peak of the market. Welcome, Larry. Next is David Dubay, president and CEO of Crown Produce, longtime CPMA board member and veteran of the uh, produce industry. And we also have Quinton Woods, sales and plant operations manager at Gwimdale Farms. Quinton is on a few CPMA committees, including our uh, CGEM, uh, North American uh, Trade Working Group. And it's great to see Quinton here as he brings, I'm going to say, that youthful perspective relative to what is the, this industry going to look like for him when he's as gray as the rest of us on this panel. Uh, then we go on to our current chair at CPMA, Guy Millet executive vice president 
at Cushion LaRose. Welcome, Guy. So I'm going to hand it back to David. He's going to start the process of having an open discussion with our panel. And David, I throw it to you to pose your first thought or question to the uh, group. Great. Quinton, Larry, David, Guy, uh, great to, uh, to see you all. I'm going to start, uh, Quinton, with you, but I'm curious everybody to, to chime in on this question. We've, we've, it's been just over a month since the election. We've got a new cabinet. Uh, we know when Parliament's coming back, uh, November 22nd. What are the top issues keeping you up at night, Quinton, as an operator, as a, as, a, as a leader in the sector that you think parliamentarians, their staff and other policymakers in Ottawa need to be aware of as this new government gets, gets to work? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, the biggest thing that's keeping us up at night right now is, is really just business continuation. Uh, every day we come in and we're facing new hurdles that we we didn't face before. Some of them include supply chain disruption, uh, financial protection. But the biggest one for us is is labor, uh, access to labor, and, and being able to hire enough staff for our operation to continue our business. And Larry, what are your thoughts? Well, I agree with Quentin. Labor is a, is a major issue, and we're doing a little bit of work on that. But our whole industry, what keeps you up at night is the rising costs about everything that we use, whether that's packaging, boxes, transportation, labor, everything's going up as well as having a tough time finding labor. And it, this is a major issue for the produce industry, and it will increase food prices. There's no doubt about that. There's no way the farms can absorb all these costs. We're going to have to pass them on to the consumer, and that, that's a concern. What about you, David? What's... Uh... What's got you re reaching for the melatonin these days? And I am reaching for it. Um, <laughs> well, I was I would share with you that the last 18 months were different than I think the next 18 months would be the last 18 months. You know, what kept me up at night was the safety and security of our team, our, our team members, you know, and the protection of their jobs. You know, moving forward right now, it's the status of labor markets, it's inflation. And the biggest concern is whether or not we can find new employees to replace the departing ones and new employees to help grow our business. That labor market is a big concern. Lastly, but not least, Guy, uh, what, what's, what's on your mind? Thank you, uh, David. Um, hearing all these nightmares that keeps my colleague of the industry awake at night, I must say that agriculture industry and its distribution structures are very strong and sturdy. But looking at all the preoccupation and challenges existing and future, the end result will be a large inflation of prices across the industry. And the biggest loser will definitely be the consumer. Even as the entire industry is going to be under real pressure, the consumer is definitely going to take a beating with those prices exploding. That what's keep me up awake at night. And I just just to add to that, you know, what yeah. sometimes happens is, you know, as consumers go to the grocery store and they see their prices go up and the perception of it is often higher than than reality. But that perception then becomes political pressure on mm -hmm. decision makers to do something about it. And the consumer doesn't really know why. And that's the hardest part about this issue is that they're they're sort of just dealing with it. Um, well, it's frustrating, too, David, because we hear. The inflation is transitory. I've heard that for 18 months from the Bank of Canada. Everything in life is transitory except for death and taxes. It's for how long and how much will it be? And, and I think that we have to, as an industry, we're putting together all these inflationary pieces. What we feel like are probably going to be labor inflation. We're definitely seeing it with um, infrastructure, supply chain disruptions, the inflation coming from that. You start to tack all of these things on. And it's how big is the problem and how long will it last for? Yeah, David, that's, that's a, a really good point. And, and with Guy, you know, uh, talking about inflation, the biggest thing is primary production is, is we're actually not even in control of our margins. And uh, we're seeing our, our margins erode as inflation continues to rise. So it's a very consumer or very scary situation for both the consumer and the primary producers. And I will continue on that real quick by saying that margins are eroding, obviously. Price at the retail levels are extremely higher than they used to be, but there's less profit for every players within that industry. You know what, guys, listening to uh, what's keeping you up at night, I think I want to pull out 
one piece that I heard through that. And I think it's something we're all dealing with and that's supply chain disruptions. And, you know, we've all become increasingly aware over the last year of the challenges in our supply chain to keep product moving, right? A number of stories about, you know, the costs of shipping and the, the rising shipping costs. Uh, let's just be very blunt about it. Um, port congestion, you know, the challenges we've seen, product shortages. You know, some these are just some of them, and I'll let you guys maybe frame more, but maybe can you give me give me some insight as to what you think the parliamentarians are going to hear, you know, from their constituents as we head into the holiday season. Because, you know, it's funny, anecdotally, I'm hearing people saying already, oh, geez, I'm ordering my Christmas presents now because mm -hmm. with all the shipping container issues, I'm not going to be able to get my the toys for my kids. And I'm laughing going, don't worry about the toys. Worry about the turkey, the potatoes and the stuffing because food is the priority here. So let's throw that back. You know, what's what's your thought around supply chain disruption? Well, toys from one side, turkey on the other side, and you can put fish gear in the middle. <laughs> joking aside. So among some of the most important disruptions, uh, I will name transportation issue. We've been hearing about it from day and night, train, uh, trucks, uh, plane, containers, no matter what they are, they accumulate and they have a domino effect on our industry. Among them, as a result of worldwide container circulation issue, shipping line and transport companies are exploding the price as there is no more roof and sky's the limit. What have we seen lately in some origin? 200, 300, 400 prices increase. Is there a sheriff in town? Who will get involved, if not federal government, to put a stop to a uncontrolled manipulation of freight costs from multinational company who seems to follow no rules? You know, before I throw it over to one of the other panelists, I heard numbers around you know fifteen to twenty thousand dollars now to mm -hmm. uh, to have access. David, you're nodding there. What are your thoughts? Oh yeah. Well, I mean. This supply chain disruption was somewhat predictable and, you know, we could see it even a year ago when uh, Chinese manufacturers we were shipping, they were taking container ships and sending them back empty rather than waiting. If you don't think we're in an economic war during this pandemic, we are in an economic war. And I think we have to recognize, I hope the federal government recognizes this because this is going to have a dramatic impact on everyday Canadians. Uh, the inflation flows down to them. We'll get into, I hope we get into food waste and food security because the impacts of these supply chain disruptions are having on food waste is it's criminal um, and it's driving prices up. So I, I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure, about real infrastructure investments, about improving our ports. Uh, but again, how long is this disruption going to last for it? it the ports are not over capacity in some areas. When I hear stories of Costco and Walmart renting their own shipping, their own ships, smaller ships, so they can go into smaller ports like Portland rather than Long Beach, other places just to make sure that they don't have a retail disaster at Christmas. Uh, they can do a lot of independent things for the rest of us importing food for Canadians, fresh food for Canadians. We don't have those options, and it's going to be reflective in the prices that they pay. I hate to say it. Food inflation, I think you're bang on. This is one of the outputs that we're going to experience from these disruptions. So maybe I'll throw it over to Quentin, primary production. You know, how, how do you see it from your end of the scale? Uh, thanks, Ron. Uh, it's, it's all over the map in, in reality. Like we're seeing container shortages. Uh, I mean, I hate to harp on it, but uh, the multinational steamship liners are, are virtually taking advantage of the situation. I mean, they're bumping bookings and then they're reselling you the new booking at a, an exponential rate of what you had already had a commitment for. They're holding rates for no more than 15 days with, and then you sign the rate and there's no capacity to move the, to the, move the product. Right. So we're having huge issues with, with ports and, and, and uh, just container shipping in general which is starting to now see um, we're having an issue with parts, getting parts, whether it be John Deere now on strike or parts for electronic components for packing equipment, 
Um, we have machinery that's been down for weeks, uh, months on end because we can't get the components to ship so or to put into the machines uh, to get them back up and running, whether it's pallets. I mean, there was a huge pallet shortage uh, and now the price of pallets is two, three, four times the cost of what they used to be. Uh, packaging prices are increasing rapidly. We're up to 40 percent almost increase on plastic year over year, 25 uh, percent on corrugate. So it's just where does it end? And the reality is what everybody's touched on is it's, it all comes back to the consumer. It's going to affect the Canadian's consumer. So, you know, Larry, Yank, you former CEO for one of the biggest cooperatives in Canada. Um, you know, wh- how do you see this uh, as a, I guess, or how do you see this issue and what do you think parliamentarians are going to hear? I think parliamentarians are going to hear about produce shortages. Uh, I don't want to say the sky is going to fall. Or we're not going to have nothing in the produce department. But we are, as Canadians, are accustomed to having whatever we want in our local store any time of the year because we get food from all over the world. I think they're not going to have that selection anymore. Uh, We talked about the disruption in containers, trucks. uh, Those are major industry things. I think the produce industry is really good at bobbing and weaving. Uh, That's what we do before pandemics, you know, rain, snow, hot weather, cold weather. Uh, we're used to doing all that, but I think there's a certain things that are going to be out of our control uh, and transportations, some of them, trucks and, and uh, containers are something that we need to get our products to the stores. And I think that's going to be a challenge. All right. Well, you know what, maybe we'll hand it back to uh, David. I don't know. It's uh, Larry. I don't want to say the sky's falling either, but boy, I know, industry have their hands full on just managing this. David? It's, uh, I work with a lot of different sectors and the labor question is, is one that's just overwhelming. It feels like politicians need to stop talking about creating jobs and filling the ones that, that are open, right? And, and it's, a, it's, it's hard for them to get out of that frame because for years we've been talking about grow, 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 where we can't grow if we can't fill these jobs. Um, I do want to shift the gears a little and talk about food security and food waste um, I think one of the, the really interesting and important outcomes of this pandemic was the, the way the federal government invested um, in food security programs, recognizing some of the problems that existed. You know, there was the surplus food rescue program, as an example, which demonstrated, you know, our ability to move food uh, through the system um, that was federally funded and support Canadians at risk while also reducing food waste. I think it was a, a, a real win-win, an example of collaboration between the industry and, and government um, and, and um, uh, nonprofits and, and charities as well. This is an area that I think needs to continue in some way. So I'm, I'm curious, and I'll start with you, David. Um, is, there, is there other things that, that can be done through government? I, I just think of like, you know, supporting school lunch or, or snacking programs. Is there other ways that we can, you know, reduce food waste, but also do good and help people who need, who need help in, in these kind of ways? Well, I think we have to take the learnings from the pandemic and, and the, the surplus food rescue program and start a, at least start a dialogue interprovincially with the federal government about talking about what we can do with excess food. You know, I think I, I hinted at it. The problems with supply chain disruption is when you're going from 21 days regularly on a ship to now 60 plus days, those containers are arriving. And they've got 40 to 50% shrink in them. And that's just, that, that's abject food waste. It's disgusting to all of us to think that we're throwing that away. It's also, again, going back to inflation, it's going to hit those consumers because the, you know, supply has been cut by 40 or 50%. Well, that, we all know what that does to pricing in the marketplace. So we need to be more efficient and we need to have a coordinated response. And that means industry working together you know, we all, I think each one of us panelists can say, oh, no, we donate lots of distressed or not number one product to our local food banks. But that's not the most efficient way we can get it into the hands of those, of those that need it the most, that are vulnerable. And I think that the learnings we have has got to be a continuation moving forward uh, to try to find better solutions. And, and Guy, what are your thoughts on this, this kind of program? Um, for sure that um, many will see these type of program, uh, food rescue program. Um, what is really sad is it happened during pandemic. 
you know, why have we not done that before? There's always been some food to be rescued somewhere. And many will see this as an expense for the federal budget. But with cost-effective management structure, there is so many positive insight from growers up to the consumer in needs. If you really take the time to consider all angles and read between the lines, this could be a social economy. Such programs should be a keeper in the actual form or any others. I'm following David on that. We need to start talking about it. How about you, Quentin? Yeah, David, uh, honestly, I think by the time the donations happen to the food banks, it's almost too late, right? Like it's the food's Mm -hmm. already partially spoiled at that point. And and it's about saving the food and getting healthy, nutritious, good quality food to, to Canadians in, in a reasonable time frame, And I, I, the one thing that I liked about the food rescue program was you had central buying that created buying power with distribution networks to, to move this product out to various food banks across the country um, and different food organizations across the country. So it gave the, it gave the farmer or the producer or the wholesaler a fair price for the goods that they were looking to move. It gave the food banks, the, the distribution networks, a, a good buying power. And at the end of the day, it was saving food waste and it was feeding Canadians. And I think that's really important. Larry, did Can you... Can I just jump in? Yeah. I just want to jump in for one, just to oh, David, reiterate one, one piece of it. And that is, you know, we talk about sustainability all the time. And I think we pigeonholed sustainability as only something about carbon and fossil fuels Food is about sustainability. We, we invented sustainability. We wouldn't be on this planet without it. And I, I go to Quentin, you know, if you can pay a reasonable price to it to get it into the hands of everyone, this is a social program that makes so much sense that the infrastructure already exists. We just don't have the relationships um, and a method of, of, of working together as one. Larry, I'll come to you in a second. Guy, you, you, you wanted to jump in and just add something here. Absolutely. You know, sometimes, you know, everybody in the industry has been doing food bank for forever. Everybody does his fair share into this. But I always had the, the impression that helping food bank will help a small percentage of peoples in this community where uh, a food security or food, a food program like we had in the past year helps a much larger range of peoples. Interesting. Larry, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. Food security, it's been an issue for a long time. The pandemic, of course, has made it worse for many families that are, <clears throat> that are struggling, but we need to work with government or governments to figure out a better way to reduce uh, food waste and surplus food. But I, I work closely with food banks, and there's a lot of great organizations, tons of organizations across the country that help out people that need food. We need to continue working with them and come up with a structured plan that goes well beyond pandemic problems and tries to solve some of the problems we had for a long time. You know what, guys, what I'm, I know what I'm hearing is uh, what can we do federally and how do we bring the provinces along, I think. And I think what we saw, you know, historically uh, where it was always federally, you know, it's really a provincial mandate, too many, too much fracture in how we pull this together. Uh, but it was demonstrated throughout the pandemic, it's doable. And I think that's what I'm hearing from this group is mm-hmm. how do we now look at best practice and implement, whether it's a school snack program or a school, you know, a school lunch program, something that federal, federally driven, provincially adopted, and everybody wins. So I want to go back though, right? We've been hearing labor. Everyone here talked about labor in uh, in their first What Keeps Me Up at Night and a little bit of the uh, supply chain disruption. Larry, I want to go to you because <clears throat> throughout COVID, we know it's been an issue. And CPMA has recently uh, conducted a, a labor survey to understand what that uh, the highlights of that survey and and what the uh, real impacts are. You know, you're you're running that for us. Your your hands are right in. Can you maybe share some insight as to what you've already learned from some of the survey results? Yeah, you're right. We had the survey results come in just recently, and uh, I've been doing one-on-one interviews with uh, selected people right across the uh, supply chain to get get anecdotal uh, information from this well, additional from the survey. <clears throat> we have large, ma- major 
labor shortages in the entry level and low skill uh, labor positions like forklift drivers, graders, packers, in the warehouses and distribution centers. And that is in every city, every province, and uh, whether you're rural or you're in a major city, there's a problem with labor for that end. And these are jobs that cannot be done at home. You can't do it from the comfort of your office. We need people that are hands-on here. Um, labor costs are increasing a huge amount. Uh, we're getting into competing wars against other industries and ourselves about finding the limited labor out there. I will say that the people are happy that CERB ended. Uh, they'd like to see programs that encourage people to go to work, not encourage people to stay home. That came out very clearly as well. But we have a problem. The, the biggest issue that I've learned early on is many businesses, and I won't say everybody that I talked to or that did the survey, they're treading water. They're not moving forward. They're just getting the orders out. They're trying to do their best. So innovation and productivity is suffering as well. Mm -hmm. How do you automate some things to save some labor when you're just trying to get by day to day? So I think we have some significant challenges ahead of us, but certainly labor and distribution centers is a big one. Before throwing it back to the whole panel, guys, like Larry, how, how do we deal with this when Quentin talked about not even getting equipment, right? Like you, you want to automate, but you don't have the, the containers that are able to bring you, let's say that new piece of uh, automation that can find efficiencies. Are we, are we almost the hamster in the hamster wheel uh, spinning right now? Well, even some of the automation we have, we're having trouble getting parts for the fixing it to, to use it. Um, it really is uh, a catch-22 to some degree of how we get ahead on this issue. So let's open it up to the panel. I know we all talked sure. about labor yeah. and just a very high level, but you know, Larry touched on some key pieces. What else do you have to add? Ron, <clears throat> I'll jump in first. You know, during this pandemic, we've seen the largest monetary intervention in the marketplace in history. Um, and it won't be simple for the government to withdraw and it won't be without complications. You know, I think that the governments, the CERB and the Qs, and I, I lose all the acronyms um, over time, they've had their desired effect over the last 18 months. Um, they may have the law of unintended consequences moving forward when we're withdrawing from it. And, you know, my concern is, and I suspect, that uh, as we emerge from the pandemic, long COVID is not just simply going to be a medical condition. It's, there's going to be some hangover from some of the things. Getting those youth to emerge from mom and dad's basement where they've been streaming Netflix for 18 months and getting paid and getting them to want to work again uh, in factories and farms and other things is going to be a challenge. So I, I just... I would, I hope that the government has got a plan because if you look at the quality of the workforce today um, and workforce participation, never mind the unemployment rate, it's really, we are, I've never in 30 year history of my career had as much difficulty hiring as we're having today. And our economy has been stagnant for the last two years. So something's wrong. There's a disconnect here that we have to get to. And I, and I hope Ottawa is looking at it very carefully. So I'm going to throw another curve at everyone. So we not only have low skill challenge, you know, looking through a supply chain and, and you know, on the other at, on the other side of the cash or other side of the cash and the cashiers and the uh, serving staff. I'm also hearing the bigger challenge also out there and in the warehouse is the retiring. The number of individuals who have just decided I'm 50 years old, 55 years old, I, I'm, I'm just packing it in. You know, is that something we're starting to see where people are leaving? They haven't made a decision where, but they're just leaving their work. I see heads nodding. It is. Um, like we're seeing, uh, we're not necessarily in retirement yet, but but there's a lot of guys that started talking about it that weren't talking about it 12 months ago. And and, and their frame of talking about it is within the next year. Yeah. So it, it's we're already having trouble hiring people to fill the positions of, of open roles and, and we have more open roles than we've ever had in history. But one thing that's happened in the pandemic is there's been a huge transition in mentality around labor and, and jobs. And people have realized that there's more important things to life than working and making money. I had one of my, one of my staff members tell me, I don't need any more money because all more money does for me is it just buys me a nicer house. It buys me a nicer car. It buys me, you know, uh, the newest iPhone. 
they, they don't want that anymore. They want, they value how important family is now. So we're seeing a lot of that shift here too. And, and, and that's, that's, that's probably the biggest driver, but labor pool in general, like you can't hire packers. You can't hire forklift drivers. You can't hire truck drivers, yeah. you can't hire marketing staff. You can't hire sales staff. It, it's not one role. It's across the supply chain. Let's if I could jump in, if I could jump in there, uh, Ron, yeah, for sure. a second, the people I talked to about retirements, exactly what Quinton said. Most people aren't losing people to retirement immediately because they're hanging in to help us help the industry get through their yeah. company to get through this. But they are talking about doing it in a year or two versus they're hanging on right now because they know that they need to help their companies. And I think that's fabulous. And that's the way our industry works, but it will come down the road. I agree. Let's go, Guy. You, I see you're about to jump in. and. Yes, absolutely. You know, there's a clash of uh, generation on top of all that, which I've started probably a decade or two ago. And, and obviously, we do not have the same implication from workers that, uh, that are in the late 40s, 50s, then the slice of 30 to 40s, then the, the slice of 20s. Uh, it's very hard. And that started way before pandemic. So just on a brief note, following Larry's comment, I don't think that growers and packers are the only one with temporary immigrant worker needs. And, you know, we tried to look in the industry, see who is doing what, because we have our own issue by then. And even if we have all the job is getting done, we are paying hundreds and hundreds of overtime every, uh, hours every week. So as a produce distributor, we have the same issue. And the result is that Crochet will receive 35 workers from Guatemala in March of 2022 for a two years contract for jobs such as lift operator, warehouse picker, another warehouse job. These 35 workers will only represent 10% of the warehouse staff, but it will remove pressure from the actual worker and also reduce the tons of overtime we are actually financially supporting right now. There's a cost to all this, but it will bring some security. Now, I, I know David Coletto, I've seen you, Benoit, you were about to jump in here. <laughs> Uh, not an easy group to talk into, David Cleto. What, what were you thinking? I, I, as the outsider around here, I, I always just ask two questions. I hear it all the time, right? When somebody talks about labor shortages, you hear the answer: "Well, just pay your workers more, and they will come." Right, David's. Yeah, you're shaking your head. Like, address that for us, right? Like, it's not. I don't. I assume it's not that simple. But what do you say? But to they're that? good pay. These are good paying jobs in the industry. I mean, when you're talking about order pickers and and forklift operators and supervisors. These are good paying jobs. The, what has happened to our workforce over the last two years? Part of it is this has been a black swan event for sure. And it's making people reevaluate their lives and the importance of experiences and everything else and less money. I'll tell you what, if I was in the government right now and I heard everyone talking about less work and less money, I'd be very concerned about our fiscal situation you know, in the end, you can say Amazon comes into your marketplace and they came into some of our marketplaces and our people are like, wow, they're offering these jobs. And I said, you know, do the math. That's you're making more than that already on salary working here. It's access to labor. It, we, we just have less people participating in that labor market right now, whether it be lifestyle or and I think it is lifestyle oriented, whether it's on the, the youth or those preparing to retire. They're just saying, you know what? I'd rather live with less and live than on my deathbed say, you know what? I spent, I wish I'd have spent more time on the forklift. You know, we're, we're getting that. So I, I would just say that I think it's workforce participation. And in a country who is struggling and Canada struggles in the OEC nations from a productivity standpoint, we are probably going to emerge from this less productive than we've ever been before. That's my fear. And in our, it's hitting our industry and we're not the only ones. So I, we could talk about labor all day yeah. and you know what, I, I know um, we have another question because sustainability, we chatted, David, you mentioned that earlier in your uh, presentation. I'll close on this on labor complex issue we i know we're starting to hear it's not just serb it's not but it, but all of these pieces connected are creating a tsunami that i think david dubé you mentioned it, what are we in 18 months or two years down the road and where are we and gee to your point on leveraging uh some of uh 
the uh, temporary foreign workforce. Um, the bigger question is, under the new rules, they can come in, they can actually now look for other work while here in Canada, while working for you. So while it's a opportunity and tool to fill a gap, it's not a guarantee that they'll stay with the companies they come in with. So it's something we need to uh, also address relative to stability. With that, uh, let, let's talk about yeah. sustainability. And uh, David, hand it over to you. Yeah, good. Thanks, Ron. You know, as I said at, at, in my presentation, I think there's no doubt that this government, before this election, but now after, is putting climate change and sustainability at the center of its agenda. And then I think you're going to see that ex expand beyond just the, the, the typical departments. It's going to become a government-wide thing. So uh, I think it's 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 important we, we talk about what, industry is doing. There's no doubt, you know, there's lots happening in the sector, uh, the Canadian National Index, plastics, carbon sequestration, you know, lots being done in, in the fresh produce sector to support sustainability and make the sector more sustainable. Uh, but what are, you know, what are some of the things for, uh, for everyone around this, this, this conversation that, that, that policymakers, um, decision makers in government and in the new cabinet need to know and hear from about what um, to move these uh, ideas and policies forward that, that works for everybody, I guess, is, is really the, the key point here. Uh, and maybe, Larry, I'll, I'll get you to chime in first there and we'll, we'll pull others in. Well, I agree, David, when you said that the, our industry is doing a lot more than we're getting credit for. There's a lot of mm -hmm. great initiatives that have happened and a lot of great initiatives happening right now. And I think when government's looking at things, they've got to give credit for what's already been happening. As we go forward, I think it's with the government's got to be careful and do it in a measured way. And we all agree that we want it. There's an environment problem. We need to get better. There's no basic disagreeing with that. But we have to be careful in exactly how we do that. And my, my favorite example is on the plastics one, which is close to our industry, uh, eliminating plastic that helps uh, produce have a longer shelf life. It's got plastic out of the, the dump, but has created food waste. Mm -hmm. So that's an unintended consequences, perhaps like some other programs are. I think we really have to have a careful look at that. Are there any other uh, thoughts, guys? Yeah. I know we're running short on time, but maybe one more thought if anyone has it before I throw one of my favorite topics out to the group. Yeah, Ron, I'll just go back. Uh, I, think, go ahead, uh, I think Larry's right because um, there's always unintended con consequences, but we just need the government to stay engaged and consult on policies before they deploy them. And now that we have, let's call it the most environmentally friendly environmental minister ever in history. You're being very politically correct. <laughs> it's very scary <laughs> as an industry that uh, there could be a lot of whim decisions made that would have large consequences on an industry like ours. And we just need to make sure that the government's going to consult us every, every way of, on every, every time on the way, you know, like just on every decision, they need to have our input on it. Yeah, I got to hold just... it with that guys. I know, <sighs> I know David, you can, we'll circle back because I don't want to lose my last uh, question. Actually, David, I'm going to ask you, because yeah, you're one of the longest standing uh, actually CPMA directors on this call and uh, or all this webinar. Um, and you know, this topic on financial protection is very important to me, to our organization, to our industry. So, you know, coming into this uh, election now coming out, we had the Conservatives, the NDP, the Bloc, all put into their platforms support for putting a tool forward to protect produce sellers in the event of a bankruptcy and insolvency. Um, liberals also express an openness to uh, discussing the issue and moving forward. The tides are there. What are your thoughts on, you know, how we have to move forward around trying to convince government to finally make this happen? You're right. We've been dealing with this issue for an awfully long time. And, and our friends in the U.S. have had PACA for many years, and it's worked fantastically well. It's, it is the gold standard for it. And I think we just need government to be, this is a proactive issue, even though we've been dealing with it for maybe 20 years, we've been proactive. You have to be proactive. You can't wait for a disaster or a large bankruptcy to then be Superman and swing into action. It's too late then. So I think it's a trade issue. I think that it's a massive trade issue with the U.S. You know, that, that we need to have 
a reciprocation over time again, like we used to have uh, in terms of protection. And this industry is, is a vital industry. We were told over the last number of months that we are a critical industry to feed people. And so now more than ever, we just need to engage in that dialogue that says, we don't need much. We just need support on the issue. We're very happy over the years. We've got many parties to engage on it. And I'm comfortable that this government will will listen and, and understand that this is something, this is a support for industry. This is not a subsidy for industry. So I'm gonna throw the same question at Quinton because we do have some members and staffers on this webinar. So what, what would you say if you were in the elevator with them around having a uh, financial protection tool? You know, Ron, I, I've been heavily ingrained in this issue for the last couple of years, um, being affected by it uh, five years ago myself, five or six, seven, eight, whatever, how many years ago already, and, and which is what, what caught our interest on this issue. But my biggest fear is it's going to be too late. And, and the government's response to us is we've always had to prove harm. And, and it's an analogy that I like. It's like asking for house insurance after your house is burnt down. And, you know, you talk about willingness from the Liberal government. It, it seems to be that they talk willingness, but they're very unwilling. And that mentality needs to change. It's, it's a nonpartisan issue. Industry is coming to the government with a solution. And it just needs a little bit of willingness from the government to make it happen. And it's a perfect opportunity for the government to collaborate with um, opposition parties on an issue that would offer a, a good solution for everybody with no impact to the government and no cost. So everyone, I know you all have a thought to put into this, but we have just less than a minute to go. And I do want to respect the time of the panel and the participants. Um, so at this point, I'd like to say thank you. So David Coletto, as usual, fabulous insights at the beginning. Thank you for helping moderate this panel. To our panelists and industry leaders, thank you to each of you for your insights, your thoughts, providing clear direction, I think, as to you know some of the issues we're dealing with. And hopefully the listeners are able to take some of this information and utilize it, whether they're members of parliament or staffers or industry themselves. And as always, the association is here for everyone. If you have questions, contact me, contact the staff. And we're here to try and help. And I'm not just saying that because I'm from Ottawa. Um, the, uh, the next exciting thing, I just want to wrap up with a little bit of a plug. You know, now that the federal election has come to an end, uh, the Canadian uh, Produce Marketing Association, Association and the Canadian Horticultural Council are again going to host their event, an annual event. We're not going to be doing it in person because of COVID, but we will be running a series of meet and greets with key members of parliament. And these virtual meetings are going to basically bring together industry leaders and basically give us an opportunity to talk about the key policies and priorities that were in the various parties' platforms. So we're there to basically make the connection and show your policy platform was focused on this and our issue is this, and there's a perfect linkage or alignment to try and work together to move collaboratively together into, uh, into this uh, 44th Parliament. So the meetings are going to be scheduled through November and December to provide flexibility in the post-election environment and to accommodate the uh, parliamentarian schedules. So you can register at cpma.ca, and I would encourage everyone to be a part of the event. So again, thank you, David Coletto. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to our participants who have listened to us go on about where we're going, the key issues, and how this new minority government is going to move forward in the next few years. Thank you, have a great day, and look forward to seeing you on future CPMA webinars. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys.